I'm going to tell you how this all started. And it begins with an 88-year-old woman who I had in the Floro Suite. And she had upper esophageal sphincter achalasia, meaning the upper esophageal sphincter would not open. And um, I was working with a new ear, nose, and throat physician at the time. And the, the fact was that uh, there's really nothing a speech pathologist can do about severe UES achalasia. No, nothing was going into her esophagus. So I showed the video to the, my ENT colleague, and I suggested to her that she dilate the upper esophageal sphincter because it, this problem could be caused by scar tissue, but it could also be a neuro, neurologic condition. So I said, when you're in there, maybe you could shoot a little Botox and that would relax the muscle fibers if that was the problem. And, and my hope was one or both would help and, and um, make a difference for this little 88 year old woman who weighed about 80 pounds. And uh, lo and behold, it worked. She took her to the OR and within a half an hour, this woman was eating and drinking. So that was great. However, about three months later, evidently uh, it didn't last and she went back to the doctor. And uh, I didn't know anything about this, but they repeated the same procedure. And um, a week or so later, the woman came to the clinic that I had with that same doctor. And she said, um, after you did that dilation and, and Botox the second time, it worked really great for I could eat solid food again, but I can't drink liquids. So now think about that. Like, how could the solid food get through, but not liquids or what could be happening with liquids? So um, I asked her to show us and she took a drink and she swallowed. And about a second later, it shot back out like a geyser. I couldn't believe it. And so she did it a second time. Again, took a drink, swallowed, comes flying back out. So, of course, I was teasing the doctor, how much Botox did you put in there? And, you know, what did you do? So, uh, and now this is kind of a dire situation. You know, a person like this could uh, dehydrate rather quickly. And um, we were both worried about her. And so I happened at the time to remember being on a van leaving the dysphagia research society meeting and hearing a gastroenterologist in the back of the airport van say that the lower esophageal sphincter opens upon exhalation. And uh, I had no idea about that, but for some miraculous reason, I heard him uh, I was probably interested because if if you know anything that I've been doing over the years, I've been interested primarily in breathing and swallowing interactions. But somehow uh, it came to mind while the woman was sitting there. So I had the idea that if the lower sphincter stays open during exhalation, I could prolong her exhalation by asking her to take in more air and to exhale slowly. So had nothing really to lose. So I told her, you know, take a drink, you know, hold it in your mouth. I want you to breathe in through your nose. I want you to hold it, swallow and exhale slowly. Again, in my mind, I'm like, keep that lower sphincter open. If it's gone, it can't shoot back up. And she did it and it worked. So I'm going to explain this image to you. This is called a Klaus plot after a man named Klaus who developed this and show you what peristalsis looks like. And I hope this helps to give you a mind's eye of peristalsis and esophageal clearance. So we're going to look at this scale here. And um, when we get more toward the blue these are lower pressures. And when you get here into the red and magenta, these are the highest pressures that are measured. And so it's kind of like a color coding 
for this image that you're looking at. And, and what this is, is um, the catheter is here in the esophagus. Okay, so here's the stomach, it's a little cartoon. Here's the upper esophageal sphincter. Here's the lower esophageal sphincter. And um, so the catheter is here. So we're, we're seeing this little high pressure. So what's it look like over here? This is the upper esophageal sphincter. That's the transducers that are up there. And this is the lower esophageal sphincter, okay? And what we see here is, um, believe it or not, if you look at these bands, inhalation, told you they were in close proximity, inhalation is the dark blue. So someday I hope that we are measuring breathing and swallowing coordination and esophageal manometry at the same time. And I'll show you more of that later. So let's look at this. So I'm gonna take this, this is a swallow. So we have some tone here in the esophagus. Here it's opened up, okay? So this is the swallow onset and then it closes. You see it closes rather tightly. Then we see the peristaltic wave begins and you see these um, colors indicating higher pressure. And guess what this is where we don't see anything? That is the transition zone. Okay, this is where uh, we don't have peristalsis. This is the dead zone. And then coming down here, we see um, the peristaltic wave and the closed LES. So here's the open LES, by the way lower esophageal sphincter. So again, this is what peristalsis looks like. And the color is uh, an indication of how much pressure there is. So there's less pressure here and more pressure here if you look at this scale. So as I mentioned earlier, I did stop doing the therapy and I demanded that we do something do some kind of preliminary work or study. And this is the actual data uh, from this preliminary um, work. And so what we see here is, um, let me go back here. You don't see anything uh, here, but remember inhalation's blue. So we see this dark blue here. So this looks like a good swallow where they inhaled before, let's say. But this is the maneuver, all right? And, and we can see here, it's kind of um, obliterated and showing this negative lower pressure in the esophagus, okay? Now here we have the swallow. Here's the peristaltic wave, but here is some increased pressure, something going on in the transition zone. And then again, the rest of the peristaltic wave. So if you look here, we can compare normal peristalsis and then the Diaz technique. So again, we don't see anything here. And here's a big change in the esophagus. And here we have the dead zone. And here we have some activity. So uh, this and another uh, data that we collected that day convinced me that we were causing physiologic changes in the esophagus in healthy people. So it seemed to me to be sound enough that I could use these two examples. And I did to explain to patients, in addition to the fact that we don't have much data, what changes we could affect. So this is one of my favorite videos. If you've ever gone in any lectures I gave, given, you've probably seen it because I, I think this is one of the best examples of using a higher lung volume to increase subglottic air pressure and improve swallowing motor output. So it's like the signal, the, the respiratory system has is informing, let's say the central pattern generator for swallowing. And if the central pattern generator in the brainstem gets the signal like, oh yeah, my I'm well pressurized, got a lot of air in my lungs, 
um, fire away and, and you get a stronger, better swallow. I've seen this multiple times. So in this patient, he's on his medications. You'll see some wires. He has deep brain stimulators, bilateral, and you'll see his typical swallows. Um, you'll see a uh, pretty gross aspiration before and because there's residue after the swallow when he swallows at his typical lung volume. <clears throat> then I'll increase the lung volume. I'm not happy about his shoulders coming up, but this is something that just happened. So here's the wires for his deep brain stimulators. So kind of keep your eyes on the airway. So this is his typical swallow with thin liquids, aspiration before. Now this time he aspirates after from all the residue. Now watch his shoulder, he's gonna take a big breath, gonna hold it, he's gonna swallow and you don't see anything. So I gave him a larger amount. Nice big breath, hold it, swallow. I want to address the command. Take, I want you to breathe in, take a big breath. Like I told that patient, like, like um, is in the technique. And um, this is a study by James Curtis and uh, fairly recent. And this is a quote from the study. They looked at different cues for respiratory swallow patterning in Parkinson's disease. And they found that cues given at high tidal volume inhalation were most likely to elicit the optimal um, breathing swallowing or respiratory swallow coordination, while cues given at low tidal exhalation were the least likely to elicit optimal respiratory swallow coordination. And so, uh, um, in the early studies, I think I'll bring myself back. In the early studies I, that I did with colleagues on um, uh, subglottic air pressure, I actually had a cricothyroid puncture. So I participated in every study and and subjected myself to everything before subjecting any research subjects um, to what I had planned. So I had a cricothyroid puncture. And I can tell you, uh, and I swallowed at different lung volumes, and I did my best to swallow during inhalation. But every time I stopped to swallow, exhalation began, that passive exhalation. So that exhalation, um, it, it, it seems as though when you're, when you're preparing yourself and going to swallow, uh, that's that beginning of the deglutitive apnea that you can't really control. So cueing someone like I've been, take a big breath. I'm not cueing them to swallow during inhalation. They will exhale and swallow at early exhalation, hopefully. So who's appropriate for the therapy? I would say relatively healthy people who have had esophageal pathology ruled out, but who still complain that it doesn't go down Food sticks in my throat. I feel like I have a lump in my throat. I have tons of mucus. I throw up without warning shortly after meals. I'm constantly burping. These are some of the things I pulled that we heard over and over and again. Um, I have a lump in my throat, but nothing is there. I have constant phlegm and mucus, but no one can figure it out. I burp all the time, but my swallow studies are normal. Food comes up unexpectedly and is not digested. Nothing shows up on the tests. I have to run to the sink and make myself bring it back up. I've heard that a bunch of times. I don't know how they do it. And then, of course, they say that nothing is wrong, but it's painful when I eat. <laughs> 